Amen. Good morning again, everybody. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, again, to any visitors that may be with us, I don't think I greeted you this morning when I was talking. So hello, <laughs> uh, welcome to Grace Place, and we praise you. Uh, praise God and thank you for being here and worshiping with us today and pray that if you uh, are looking for a church home that you prayerfully consider making Grace Place your uh, home of uh, worship and come out and uh, gather with us. There's a beautiful body of Christ and uh, there are some visitors cards in your seat pockets. You can fill those out and leave them on your seat when you leave today uh, just so that the church can gather those and know who you are visiting with us today and pray for you. Um, and again, we just want to come and worship God in spirit and truth and certainly be in his presence this morning. Amen. Amen. Uh, for those of you who, uh, well, let me, maybe I should ask. I say that's, you know, Jesus say, teach today, observe. What are we talking about all year long? Names of Jesus. Names of Jesus. What, what, what specifically is the, the theme? Power in his name. Amen. All right. I, I, see, I needed to ask that this morning because it's already June 1st. And I say, what have we been talking about all year long? <laughs> so Jesus said, teach today, observe. We've been talking all year long about Jesus, power in his name. Every Sunday, we have been looking at the different names that the Bible applies to Jesus Christ to find out what we can find out about that name, but not just for intellectual or head knowledge about Jesus Christ, but for a greater intimacy of who he is, because as his people, we certainly want to know who he is, and we want to know who he is to us, for us, and through us. And so that's why we have been studying the different names of Jesus, and this theme for the rest of the year is Jesus, power in his name. So Lord willing, if I come in next Sunday and say, what we've been talking about, I'm not going to get, I'll get, we're talking about Jesus and there's power in his name. In fact, even if you don't say it like that, because I've already gave you your script for next week. Even if you don't say it like that, I would pray that after six months of talking about the different names of Jesus, after looking at his identity, after seeing who he is, I pray that we wouldn't have to come into a congregation and, and, and say it because we've been cued. I pray that it would show up in our lives. I pray that somebody will be able to watch you or me or uh, whoever in this building today walking down the street on our jobs, how we interact with our family, how we deal with issues and other people and be able to say there's something different about us. And when they ask us for that reason that we're strange, that we're peculiar, that we seem like nothing is bothering us, even in the midst of what we go through, we can turn around and say, you know what? I know somebody named Jesus Christ. And he is the one that keeps me in my storms. He is the one that provides for me. He is the one. And so there is power in his name. Amen. And so today we want to look at a particular title um, for Jesus. And it's Jesus, the Holy One of God. How appropriate that song in the presence of Jehovah in the presence of Yahweh, in the presence of God Almighty. And so today we're going to be looking at Jesus, the Holy One of God. You say, what does that have to do with in the presence of God? I hope you already know because Jehovah God, Jesus is holy. He is holy. And so when we talk about being in his presence, we're talking about being in the presence of one who is holy. And that term in the Bible and the term that we're going to use today uh, when I get to the text is hagios, and it means holy, but it, it, it has a little different definition than we think of because sometimes we refer to other things besides God as holy. Amen? The Holy Bible. Not that it's not holy. The Holy Sanctuary. Uh, sometimes we try to act like we're holy. Uh, but the reality of it is on, on our best we don't compare to the Holy One. He is completely holy. He is completely other. In fact, when you look at that word hagios, it, it means awful. Awful. How'd you like somebody come to you and say, you know, man, you're awful. <laughs> you know, sister, you're awful. That's our context. But in the context of the word hagios, awful doesn't mean awful in a bad way. It simply means it is awe-inspiring. It is terrifying. It is dreadful in the respect that there is nothing else that we can compare it to. And so when we say God is hagios, when we say Jesus is the hagios, it means that he is holy. He is awesome. There is nobody like him. The word means awful or awe-inspiring. It also means pure in every sense and in every portion of one's being, 
physically, morally, spiritually without flaw. That's what it means to be holy. It means to be sacred or consecrated or set apart. Watch this for ceremony, service, or sacrifice. And so when we say something is sacred in the church, these communion trays are sacred. They, they're, they're, they're just made of metal and uh, tin, and, uh, but, but they're sacred because of the purpose, the ceremony that we use them for. And so when we talk about Jesus being hagios, Jesus being holy, we are saying he is pure in every aspect of who he is, and he is consecrated by God, set apart for ceremony, service, and sacrifice. Holy means to be transcended. It means to be above and beyond and, and, and far greater than any tangible thing that we can put our hands on. It, it brings to mind the term ethereal, which means otherly or, or otherworldly, beyond the scope of our uh, physical world. And, and so when you hear me talk about God a lot of times, and I like to brag on God, I told you I want to be a worshiper, so I don't mind bragging on God. I don't mind lifting up Jesus. It means that he is other, and that's one of my favorite titles to use for God. He's other. You can't compare him to anybody else. Now, I know you all are saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Spirit up in here. So many of you all are not even going to get this, but way back in the day when I used to go to the clubs and stuff, Lord, help me, Holy Spirit to stay on track. There was a, a group out called The Time, and they used to have a song called I'm Just Cool, and at the end of that song, they would say, ain't nobody bad like me. Amen. At least one other person <laughs> was at the club with me. But they would say, <laughs> she was, but <laughs> thank God for salvation. Hey, y'all, y'all, don't be looking back at me like you don't know, you don't. Uh. But he would say, ain't nobody bad like me. The point I'm making is ain't nobody bad like God. Nobody better than God. And so when you hear me brag on him and say he's other, that, that is a, a term of praise and worship because, God, there is nobody like you. And if you stopped and thought about it for a few minutes this morning, you'd help me praise him. You'd get excited, too, because there is nobody else like God. I don't know about anybody else, but he is the only one that has never broke a promise. He is the only one that has never turned his back. He is the only one that has never left nor forsaken us. He is the only one that shows grace and mercy time and time and time again. Ain't nobody bad like him. We don't even have to have time to start talking about God in creation stepped out into nothing. I, I wish I could, all 200 plus pounds of me, just step off this stage and stay floating in the air and start commanding stuff. He is the only one that was able to stand on nothing and say, let there be light. Let the heavens dig, uh, separate themselves. God, there's nobody bad like him. You go out. Oh, see, so, <laughs> let me get back. I don't have to get anybody. I don't have to cheerlead you this morning. Either you're going to worship him or you're not. But, but just in case you think that, 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 that there's somebody else that can compare to him, after service, I want you to do this for me. Go outside this door right here, grab a scoop of dust and some rocks and breathe into it and make it walk away from here. <laughs> when you can do that, then you can sit here and act like he's not holy, but he is hagios. He is otherly. He, there's nobody like him. And if there's anybody for whom that term holy fits is Jesus Christ. Jesus personifies the holiness of God, which is why we're talking about his name today being the Holy One of God. The prophet Isaiah tells us uh, over a hundred times in his uh, book of prophecy, he refers to Jesus prophesies about the coming Messiah as the Holy One of God or the Holy One of Israel. First John 1 and 5 tells us that in him there is a, a light and no darkness at all. The absence of chaos, the absence of evil, the absence of anything unpure. The author of Hebrews tells us that he was tempted in every way that we are as men and women, but he was without sin. The relig religious leaders could find no solid accusation to bring against Jesus Christ. And even Herod, after an intense interrogation, had to declare about Jesus Christ that I can find no fault in him. And so there is nobody, the prophets, uh, the, 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 the Herod and the Pharisees and the priests, and nobody uh, uh, could deny the fact that Jesus was holy. He personifies being the Holy One of God. But watch this. It's strange that the declaration about him being the Holy One of God today comes from a most peculiar place. And we're going to get to our text, uh, which is Mark, the first chapter. We're going to look at verses 21 through 28. But it's interesting when we find out where this particular title 
comes from. Now, again, the prophet Isaiah uses it over 100 and, uh, I think it's 120 times in his prophecy about the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of God. Uh, the angels declare to Mary uh, uh, on the inception of the child that that which is in her would be of the Holy Ghost and it would be a holy child. Um, Jesus this declares of himself in the book of Revelation, I am the one who is holy. And so all of these ring credence to the holiness of Jesus Christ. But today, this term holy one comes from a most peculiar source. It comes from a demon-possessed man. Hmm. I, I'm just serving notice for you now, and I'm not going to be before you long. This is going to be a different kind of sermon for some of us, which is good. Because every now and then, God got to get our attention like he got my attention even as I was working on this. So I don't have three fine points to give you today, but I just want you to walk through the text as I do some expository preaching this morning and let the Holy Spirit speak to us, speak to you. This term holy one comes from a devil. Strange place for God, son to be acknowledged and given a title or have a title affirmed by a devil. In Mark 1, 21 through 28, you'll find these words. It says, and they went into Capernaum, talking about Jesus and his disciples. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what do we have to do? What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I don't know if he said it like that, but I've watched a lot of TV. <laughs> what am I to do with you? You know, I don't know why they always make the devil sound like he need a throat lozenger or something. <laughs> you know, what am I to do? I don't know if he sounded like that or not. But he says, what do I have to do? What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, uh, I like what the King James Version says, it rent or tore him, and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And all the people were amazed, so much so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands, and even the unclean spirits, they obey him. And at once his fame spread abroad everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. Talking to us again this morning on the subject matter, Jesus, the Holy One of God. This is John Mark's gospel. Uh, it starts out in this first chapter talking about the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He starts out talking about John the Baptist, the one who was prophesied that he would come and prepare the way for Jesus Christ. He talks about Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and he talks about how after Jesus was baptized and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and a voice was heard from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Instantly, Jesus was led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After successfully refuting the devil's temptations, Jesus comes into uh, Galilee with power, with authority, and begins to preach the gospel in his hometown of Nazareth. But because a prophet is without honor in his own hometown, in other words, it's hard for those closest to you to respect and honor what God has called you to do. He could do not many works there. And so he went to a town called Capernaum, and he went to this place and kind of set up headquarters. And it is there that he begins to preach the gospel. In fact, he goes into the synagogue. God, a Jewish church, if you will. He goes into the church on the Sabbath day and he begins to teach and preach. And I told you this is not going to be your normal sermon, so buckle your seatbelt and just walk with me as we go through it. He walks into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He goes to church on the Sabbath day, on the day that everybody else goes to worship, and he goes in and he begins to teach. Let me give you a little background on the synagogue, very little, because I got some place to go with this. The synagogue was like a church. The synagogue was a place where the Jew, Jewish men came to study the word of God, to hear the word of God, and to worship God in the, 
process. Women were not allowed to worship in the synagogue. They were allowed to stand outside. They were allowed to look in the windows and hear what was going on. But it was a man thing. In fact, for a synagogue to be established, 10 families, 10 heads of families, 10 men had to come together and say, hey, on the south side of Galilee, right over here in this little corner of Capernaum, we're going to start a church or a synagogue. Why is that necessary to know? Because the temple was the place that God ordained for people to worship. The synagogue is a byproduct of being in captivity. And when the Jews came back from captivity to make it convenient for them, because not everybody could come up to Jerusalem to go to the temple every Sabbath day, they, they were allowed by rabbinical tradition and the pharisaical rule to establish these houses of God. So I just set that up to tell you it was worship day and Jesus went into the church to teach. Talking about being in the presence of Jehovah. Wonder what would happen on a Sunday morning if Jesus came into the church and was allowed to teach. Mm. Wonder what would happen if he came in right now and say, sit down, boy, I got this. <laughs> Wonder, could he command your attention? Could he get you to stop texting, stop falling asleep, stop worrying about what time <laughs> you're supposed to be out of it, <laughs> Shane's? What would happen if Jesus comes in? He comes into the temple and again, or comes into the synagogue and by tradition, even though there were rabbis or Jewish teachers, the synagogue didn't have a set pastor. And so typically whoever was the head of the synagogue, whoever the head of the families were that established the synagogue, they would allow someone to open up and read from the scrolls and expound on it. And so Jesus is given this opportunity and he comes in and he begins to teach and instantly, maybe not even after 30 minutes, not after 40 minutes, minutes after a few minutes it was obvious to everybody that this man has some kind of wisdom in fact they were scratching their heads asking the question where did he get this wisdom from because he's an unlearned man he didn't sit under any of the uh, uh, any of the rabbis he he didn't go to school under Gamaliel like Paul did uh, how, where did he get this knowledge from and, and and check this out this south side version according to Calvin they say this is a trip this man is teaching not like the scribes who come in and regurgitate like a parrot everything that they have been taught he's teaching Teaching not like the scribes who come in and have to reference the rabbis that they learn what they learn from. He's just teaching like somebody that knows the word, like it's in him, like it is him. He's teaching with authority, and that word authority is, is exousia. In other words, he's preaching with power. His words are waking us up. His word has power. We've been coming to this uh, synagogue Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, and we hear the word read from the Torah. Somebody expounds on it, and we say amen and leave and go have some Sunday or Saturday chicken. Didn't even have praise and worship. Didn't even have a praise band. Just came in and listened to the word, digested it, said, yep, that's good. Put a stamp on it. But this man is teaching the word of God as if he has authority, as if he has power. What is going on? I'm just setting this up to, to talk about the Holy One of God and this strange proclamation of where it comes from. And so these first two verses, we simply see a, a, a holy introduction of Jesus Christ into the, into the synagogue. We see a holy instruction because he begins to teach and the people all of a sudden wake up on the Sabbath day. Hey, we got a guest minister and he has got our attention and he teaches with authority. But in the midst of this, we have a problem. It says that there's a man in the synagogue and he's got what? An unclean spirit. Thank you. See, somebody is awake. He's got an unclean spirit. In other words, he has a devil. Help me, Holy Spirit. I'm just going to walk through this the way he gave it to me. This man is in the midst of them. So we have Jesus. He comes in and he gives a holy introduction of himself through his teaching. And he gives holy instruction by his teaching. But now we have an unholy interruption in the midst of holy teaching. Help me, Holy Spirit. Because I asked a question a few minutes ago, what would happen if Jesus came into the church on a Sunday and began to preach? But, but, but don't miss this. A lot of times we miss him because he is here and he is teaching and he is preaching through his word. But we miss him because sometimes there are unholy interruptions that distract us 
from focusing on Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of his teaching, this man comes in. In fact, he's already among them, and he has an unclean spirit. And my little head, if I had hair, I'd probably scratch it out, which is why I don't have hair. But I was scratching my head as I was reading this, and I said, how is it that a man with an unclean, and if you look at that word unclean, it is just the opposite of holy. It is ceremonially unclean, impure, immoral. It is everything that Jesus is not. How is it that someone with an unclean, immoral spirit opposed to God had no problem coming up into the synagogue. And how is it that the folks that were already there wasn't able to recognize that this man had this unclean spirit? Oh, it's about to get uncomfortable up in here. <laughs> he had an unclean spirit, yet he was in the synagogue. He wasn't there to learn. He wasn't there to be healed. He wasn't there for the devil to be cast out. He was just there, chillaxing. But when Jesus comes on the scene, we realize that he has a purpose for being there, and his purpose is to distract and discourage the other people from coming into a better understanding of who Jesus Christ was. Oh, preach, Calvin. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I think I will. For the last six months, I've been standing before you talking about the different names of Jesus Christ, praying that somehow through my little illegitimate teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit, because Paul said, thank you, Holy Spirit. When I came before you, I didn't speak with excellency of word. I wasn't real confident in anything about myself so that what was in me would appear to come from where it really came from, God Almighty. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about my degrees, Paul said. It was about the simple proclamation of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those that perish, but to those of us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. And Paul said, I didn't come with flashing lights. I didn't come with my pedigree or resume. I came simply as one humble enough with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to say Jesus is, and the problem right here in this particular text is Jesus is on the scene, he's teaching, but there's an unclean spirit trying to hinder everybody else from knowing who he is. And for the last six months, I've stood before you, Grace Place, and tried to tell you who Jesus is. And some of you are getting it, but some of you keep being interrupted by an unholy distraction, an unclean, immoral, impure spirit that happens to show up for that very purpose to hinder you and interrupt you from keeping your focus on Jesus. Because if you keep your focus on Jesus, you're going to start to be amazed at what he says. You're going to start to have a greater clarity of who he is. And if there's anything the devil don't want, it's for you to know who Jesus Christ is. So take five minutes while I catch a breath and pause with me and say, devil, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Because all this year, we're talking about Jesus Christ. The more you try to distract us, the more we're going to learn about him. The more you try to shade us, the more we're going to peer into who he is. The more you try to distract us, the greater our focus has to be because we know your game and we know you're here to distract us and get us off track and keep us from focusing on who Jesus Christ is. He was just there, but he had a purpose and his purpose was to impede or hinder people from seeing the person and power and purpose of Jesus Christ. And so this man is in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cries out with a loud voice. He is trying to distract the people from hearing Jesus Christ. Jesus is teaching, blessed are they who... <laughs> Got your attention. Woke some folks up over in this station. <laughs> Almost made you drop that phone. <laughs> now you got to do autocorrect because you just typed something... <laughs> Jesus is teaching, and all of a sudden, hey, 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 look at me over here. Ah! Ever have a Sunday like that? <laughs> you all are laughing, but it happens every Sunday. I'm, I'm preaching, and you don't even realize it. I'm telling you what the Lord told me to say. It happens every Sunday. Maybe not so subtle, maybe not so, but, but, but every Sunday, God is trying to do something in Grace Place, and the devil is saying, over here. I didn't speak to you this morning. I didn't agree with you at the meeting last week. I've been messing with your kids all day long. And poor pastor standing up here sweating and losing weight. <laughs> trying to point you to Jesus Christ and we're missing it because of distractions. You got that pain. That person didn't speak to you. They took your parking spot. 
distraction. And he cries out with this loud voice. Uh, and it's all an attempt to distract. Whether it's a phone ring, somebody getting up in the middle of the service, watch this grace place, or even a building project. He comes to distract us from being about our father's business. He comes to distract us from humbling ourselves and doing what God has asked us to do. And if we're not careful, even the best of us can get caught up in it. Because he's so often among us that when he cries out, we give him more attention than we should. Real quickly, and I got to move on, but it's interesting. This man is in the synagogue, and obviously he had been there before, yet none of the religious leaders had the authority or the ability to cast him out. Maybe he had never cried out before. Maybe Jesus had never been in the house before. And then he cries out, and not only does he cry out, he says, leave us alone. Let us alone. Don't miss this. I'm just walking through this. I told you what your normal sermon. I'm almost done. Look at what he says. He cries out, and now that he got everybody's attention, ha! <laughs> Look, they, they own it now. <laughs> They like, you won't get us again, Pastor. I said, ah, they was like, we ha ha, we were. <laughs> now that he's got everybody's attention, now he's gotta, because the devil never just cries out to disturb, he calls out to get an audience. He doesn't just want to distract you momentarily, he wants to distract you eternally. And so now that he cries out, he begins to speak. Leave us alone. Don't miss that. What is us? Plural. Thank you, English teacher. It's plural, but what does the Bible say? It said he had a. What is a or an? One, singular. He had an unclean spirit, but when the spirit cries out, he said, leave us alone. Now, is the Bible contradicting itself? Was it one? Was it many? It was many, but what the Bible says is he had an unclean spirit because they're all the same. Different functions, different temperaments, different personalities, but they all have one mission, and that is to kill, steal, and destroy, to distract us. So it doesn't matter whether that spirit is jealousy, it doesn't matter whether it's envy, it doesn't matter whether it's apathy, they work together, and it just, again, makes me, I'll scratch this side, so at least I'll be bald all over. It just makes me scratch my head and say, what is it about God that the devils can unify in a singular purpose for their plan, and the people of God who have been redeemed? redeemed by one blood, one faith, one baptism, and one spirit, can't come together and agree on how many light bulbs to put in the fixture. He says, we are one, but leave us alone. The devil don't mind you coming to church. He didn't mind these men coming to the synagogue. He didn't mind them studying the scrolls and reading. The, but, but what he has a problem with is when Jesus comes, his light exposes darkness. And his truth exposes lies. And his holiness exposes the baseness and perversities of mankind. And so this devil says, this unclean spirit says, this unceremonially impure spirit says, leave us alone and we are many. wonder if there's any unclean spirits in Grace Place today. I'm just teaching as the Holy Spirit gives me utterance. Wonder if there's any unclean spirits in Grace Place today. Before you get offended and say, I can't believe he's calling us unclean. The Bible says a man had an unclean spirit. It didn't say the man was unclean. It said he had an unclean spirit. In other words, there was something attached or possessing him that was beyond him. And he just brought it with him into the synagogue. I wonder if there are any unclean spirits in Grace Place this morning because we just brought stuff with us. Doesn't mean we're not saved. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. But sometimes we carry stuff or allow stuff, help me Holy Spirit, to come in with us. What stuff, Pastor, I'm glad you asked. Yesterday I was reading the Daily Bread, and some of you probably read it too. First Peter, and Peter makes this statement. He says, to get rid of all 
And then he gives a list. Get rid of all malice, envy. And I'm going to go through them real quickly because we're doing some examination now to make sure that there are no unclean spirits in grace place. I wish I had time. He says, get rid of. He didn't say compromise, cover it up, conceal. He said, get rid of, rid, rid, rid. If somebody tell you get rid of something, that means don't hold on to it. Don't get rid of it. He says, rid yourself of, and he gives a list, and he starts with this. And, and, and please examine yourself just like I had to examine myself. That's why I say don't get offended because how do you think I feel? Not only do I have to examine myself now as I speak to you, but I had to examine myself even when I was preparing the message. So I'm not beating anybody up, but we're talking about being able to recognize who the Holy One is and submit to his authority so that anything that's up in, among his people that shouldn't be here got to go. In Grace Place, if there's anything we ought to want in light of everything that we have experienced and been through as a church is to be free of the uncleanness that has prevented us from being effective for Jesus Christ. And so he says, get rid of all these things. Get rid of malice. What is malice? Malice is an intent to do harm, an intent to do wrong, an intent to disrupt, dismantle, or destroy. And let it not be said of anyone in God's house that they are here to harm or hinder or destroy. And before you say, well, pastor, we know none of us are here, check, because it may not be you, but it may be that spirit wanting to dismantle and harm somebody else's ministry because it ain't mine. Speak, Holy Ghost. Karen, you may have to pause the tape. Because I'm, I'm about to air some dirty laundry and I don't want it to get out to everybody. You ain't got to pause it. Just let the truth. I, now everybody, ooh, what is he about to say? I'm not naming names. <laughs> I'm not naming names. But if the truth comes down your aisle, put it on and walk around in it. Wanting to harm or dismantle or be malicious towards another because it's not your ministry. Or because it's not your Sunday to sing. Or because you used to be over that. And now we sit back and with impure spirits, we hope, watch this, there's something in our church fails because our hand or name is no longer attached to it. He said, get rid of that stuff. It, you know, it just kind of makes me scratch my head. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about them other churches, wink, wink. But it makes me scratch my head that we could want to see something fail that's part of us. I'm going home in a little bit if the Lord says so, and I'm going to turn on the TV and watch the second game of the NBA Finals. And if you watch the first game, and you saw, I don't even want to call his name because he's been beat up enough. But if you saw J.R. Smith at the end of that game, not being aware of what the score was, and instead of taking the ball and shooting it or passing it, he ran the clock out, and his first response was, <laughs> and, and LeBron was like, <laughs> why was LeBron upset? Because J.R. Smith made a mistake that possibly cost them the game. But I can guarantee you when they got in the locker room, even though some words may have been exchanged, LeBron was upset, and the rest of the team was upset because they realized one person made a mistake, but the entire team wants to win. And grace place, we have to get to the point where even though we make some mistakes, our motive is for the entire church to be successful and woe be us and unclean is our spirit if we can sit in this place and have malice towards anybody because it ain't us. Get rid of it, he says. And he says, why are you getting rid of malice? Get rid of deceit. Deceit is concealing truth in order to deceive someone. And unclean spirits love to operate in deceit. Since I talked about Morris Day, I might as well talk about the OJs. <laughs> Remember the backstabbers? Some of you all do. Some of y'all need to move your dial a little bit toward, <laughs> toward, toward the tan section of the radio. Uh, <laughs> OJs say they smile in your face. All the time they want to take your place. Hey, man, some OJ saying, <laughs> the backstabbers, backstabbers. That's a, that's a. <laughs> Unclean spirits always deceive because they know if they come in the house and say up front what they're about, most good Christians, even baby Christians, don't want to have any part. So when they come in, they're not going to say, hey, I'm here to wreak havoc in your church. I'm here to raise hell. I'm here to divide folks. I'm here to destroy ministry. They're not going to say that. They're going to come in saying all the right stuff. I'm blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
But their motive is deceit. They are covering up. And God says, just like you got to rid the place of malice because that's unclean, you got to get rid of anything that is deceitful, that, that has a different intention. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, don't let your good be evil spoken of. And God says, be careful, Christian, because sometimes we do things for the good purpose in the church, but for the wrong motive. And that's deceitful. I'm feeding the homeless because I want to be seen. I'm giving to this ministry because I want to be looked at. He says that's deceitful because you're not doing it for the glory of God. You're doing it for some ulterior motive. And God said that ticks me off. And if you're doing that grace place, it means that you've got an unclean spirit among you. Get rid of hypocrisy. Oh, Jesus, we all guilty of that. Attempting to put up a facade, being something to others that we know we're really not. Wouldn't it be interesting if we just came to church and was real with it? Because God say, worship him in spirit and truth. I ain't going to mess with nobody. I'm not even going to look at this section. I don't know why the Lord keep drawing me over here. I ain't, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. It could be any of us. And I've touched on this before, so I'm going to hurry up because I'm not going to take up all your time. I got to get to where I'm going. But what if we came to church and was just real with who we are? Because the last time I checked, the Bible say all of us have fallen short. The last time I checked, only Jesus is really able to wear the title Hagios Holy with perfection. So guess what? I can guarantee you, and I don't even have to know much about you because I know about me, and I'm human just like everybody else in here. I can guarantee you from last Sunday to this Sunday, everybody in here, including yours truly, has done something wrong, has said something wrong have thought something wrong. And so I'm not saying come in here and beat yourself up, but I'm not saying come in here with our chest stuck out either. I'm just simply saying come in here and be real. How you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored. No, how you really doing, brother? I just fussed at my wife because for the third Sunday in a row, we've been late because of her. She know what time we supposed to be here, and she know her stockings rip, and every week she got to wait to the last minute. But you know what if we was just real with it? How you doing, brother? And you got the kids there, and you didn't taught them how to smile and sit, and they scared to move because you told them that when you get here, don't touch nothing, don't say nothing, don't look at nothing, don't do nothing, and they just froze and waiting if they can even breathe. And you say, how you doing with your beautiful family? Tell the truth. I had to hit this girl upside her head this morning because she didn't even want to come to church. Then had the nerve to get mad because all we had was some, some egos and Lego my ego, and she wanted blueberry mud. Just tell the truth. But I'm still here to worship. Yeah, I threw something at the dog this morning, but I'm here to worship. Yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I took some stuff from the job that wasn't mine last week. I, but, but I'm here to worship God. What if we were just honest? You, you can feel the, the air coming into the room even as we think about it. What if we could just come in and be ourselves and say, you know what? I'm not perfect and I don't care who knows it because I serve a perfect Savior. You know what? I don't have it all together, but I don't care who knows because I got a God who got everything under control. You know what? I got so much junk in my closet, but I got a God that says all things are working together for good. And, and so I'm not going to come here and, and continue to wear this hypocritical mask because that's an indication that something ain't right in the house. If we got to come here and fake everybody else out, how can we go and reach a world with the authenticity of Jesus Christ? And we're not real. Help me, Holy Spirit. I got to move on. I was done in 30 minutes last week, so that ain't happening today. <laughs> I got to move on. I ain't going to start meddling. Let me get back to where I'm going. But just be real. Even if there is a place that hypocrisy should never exist, it should be in the body of Christ. And, it, and, and it's, the church is, let me leave that alone. I ain't talking about it. I ain't talking about it. But, but it's full of hypocrisy. Now, folks, I'm about international ministry. Ain't never been outside the city they live in. Got an international ministry, reaching millions of people. Got six members in your church. I'm an evangelist. Don't talk to anybody about the gospel. I'm a bishop. Can't spell it. I'm not making light of those positions. I'm just simply saying if there's one place that we can be real, it ought to be here. And he says, get rid of malice. Get rid of hypocrisy. Get rid of deceit. And what else he say? Nobody turn to Peter. I didn't give you the verse. I'm sorry. He says, get rid of deceit, get rid of hypocrisy, get rid of envy, jealousy, being jealous of someone else, their gift, their talent, their ability, as if God has somehow shortchanged you and been better to them than you. Some of us waste so much time being jealous of other people that we miss the giftedness that God has placed in us to benefit the body. Somebody missed that. Being so jealous of somebody that can sing 
that you're missing the fact that that's not your gift. And you're jealous of somebody else's gift when that's not your role. And God has gifted you to do something else. And the church and the society and the world is missing out on what he has birthed in you to bless the world with because you're envying what somebody else has. Get rid of it. Envy comes straight from the devil. The devil was jealous of God and it's foolish for the family of God to be envious towards one another because in my house we have a saying, when one come up, we all come up. Amen. If one got it, we all got it. If one is blessed by it, we all are recipients of that blessing. That's the same vibe that ought to be in the church. If sister or brother such and so has a gift that I don't have, I don't have to be jealous about it because whatever their gift is is going to benefit and bless me. Let me use the NBA model because some of you all are not getting it, so let me just give you this. When there are some folks on the team that don't play as well as LeBron. There's some folks on the team that don't get as much playing time as J.R. Smith. I don't know how much playing time he's going to get today. <laughs> but at the end of the year, if they win the championship, guess what? They're going to get a ring. And they'll be able to tell other folks that don't have a ring, I'm a world champion. But man, you didn't even, you didn't even take off your warm-ups, but I got a ring. You sat on the bench the whole time, but I got a ring. LeBron scored all the points. In fact, you all had 52 points together. He had 51 and you had one. But I got a ring. Church. Somebody else always gets to sing. Somebody else always gets to preach. Somebody else is always out front. But at the end of the day, you get a ring. You benefit. Let me move on. I think you get the point. He says, get rid of this. Get rid of slander. Slander is to malign, speak falsely, harshly, ill about somebody else in an untruthful manner. Now, you say, what is he making a big deal out of this for? Because I don't want us to just go home with a happy message. I want us to really examine, because when I was putting this message together, I believe one of the things the Lord put in my heart is, Calvin, if Grace Place is going to move forward, it's not how well you are as an administrator, not excusing any poor administrative skills on my part or anything like that. He says, but you got to understand, I am building a house. You talk to these people for the first three months about what type of house and what type of church are we going to be, and everybody responded back, God's house. He said, then if it's going to be God's house, the thing that come in God's house need to be consecrated because he is the Holy One of Israel and he does not take kindly to uncleanness in his house. Mm. What are we to do with you? Now, this clean spirit don't want to have anything to do with God. Uh, what fellowship have light and darkness? What fellowship have the children of God with sons of Belial? Uh, the devil... Doesn't want to have anything to do with God. Let me just finish this up because I think you get the point. He says, what have we had to have to do with you? Then watch this. He say, Jesus of Nazareth. He trying to distract. You say, how's he trying to distract? Jesus of Nazareth. We see hear that and we say, ooh, Jesus of Nazareth. But that was an insult. He said, what do we had to do with you? I got to remind the crowd, Jesus from Nazareth. What was he doing? He was playing on the prejudices and the pride of the crowd because the crowd, the Jewish community understood that the worst, the, the, the only thing worse than somebody from Nazareth was a Samaritan. Nothing good came out of Nazareth. Nazareth was like, I don't even want to say it because I may offend somebody in here, but Nazareth was like Gary, Indiana. <laughs> Amen. I, I see some people have been there. <laughs> <laughs> Nazareth is like Gary, Indiana. Nazareth is like Certain parts of Detroit. Nazareth is like, now the very fact that I'm mentioning these things don't mean I'm against them. I'm just simply doing the same thing this devil was doing. He played to people's insecurities and prejudices about certain places and certain people. And he said, Jesus, what have we got to do with you, oh Jesus of Nazareth? Because reminding the people he's not holy, he's not anything, he's just somebody from Nazareth. He's just somebody from the south side of Chicago. She's just somebody without a degree. they just somebody that had a child out of wedlock. And all of these prejudices hinder us from seeing what God can do through somebody. And it was, he was attempting to hinder the people from understanding who Jesus Christ was. He said, what do we have to do with you, you Jesus of Nazareth? You don't come from no place. You ain't nothing. But then he begins to speak and say, are you coming to destroy us? Because even the devils know that their time is limited. 
and they know the real purpose of Jesus Christ. Watch this, which is why they spend so much time trying to distract us because they know their days are limited and they will not relent. The devil does not take a vacation. He does not take a holiday. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is trying to infiltrate the church today and get us distracted from the reality that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Let me move on because I said I was going to finish this up. And, and he says, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. We know who you are. These evil spirits that are one in unity and in purpose and in function, he says, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of Israel. You're not just another scribe. You're not just a good teacher. You're not just a prophet. You are the holy one. You are the one that is other. You are the one that is set apart. You are the one that is consecrated. You are the one that ain't nobody bad like you. We know who you are. Does the church. The devil say, we know who you are and you must be coming to destroy us because you're not going to compromise. You're not going to let us stay here. Light and darkness have no fellowship together. You're not going to share your glory with another. And if you come into the synagogue, Jesus, you're going to deal with the unclean stuff. It's going to be some stuff that's uncomfortable in here. And so what are you here for? And if you're going to destroy us, let us know because we know who you are. Help me, Holy Spirit. I got to move on. But God say, some uncomfortable stuff going on in Grace Place. Because Jesus, <laughs> let me distinguish this because I don't want anybody leaving out of here because that's how the enemy tried to distract you. Is he saying he's Jesus? <laughs> that ain't what I'm saying. Remember the very first message that I preached to you, Grace Place? Talitha Kumi, God is breathing life back into this church. He breathes life into a dead thing by his spirit. And when his spirit comes back on the scene, what does the scripture say? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There, when God's spirit comes on the place, anything that is not of God is going to be uncomfortable. Oh, I got to preach the truth up in here whether folks like it or not. There are some folks that have left here, not because we're doing anything wrong, but because... When his spirit comes in, that that is not of God gets uncomfortable because it realizes that he's not going to let it stay long before it has to cry out, before it has to expose itself. Some stuff, let him shake. Look at what the scriptures say. I'm not making this up. Jesus, when the devil says these things, he says, you're the holy one of God. And Jesus' response is what? Shut up and get out. Oh, God, I wish I had time to preach up in here this morning. Shut up and get out. Now, nobody ever heard Jesus. <laughs> we run around trying to be nice to people. Jesus getting right to the heart of the matter. Shut up and get gone. If you're not a God, get out. That wasn't Jesus. That was the Amityville Horror. That was an old movie. <laughs> get out. But Jesus says, in essence, shut up and get out. Get gone. He ain't begging nobody to stay in his house if they don't have a part in him and in his program. Shut up and get out is what he tells them. And watch what the devil does. In his last act of disobedience and defiance, what does it do? Jesus told him to shut up. It says he cries out one last time. You ever said something to your kids? <laughs> Tell them to do something or reprimand them and they go to the room and they say, <laughs> You tell them, shut up, I don't want to hear anything else, go to your room. <laughs> what you say? <laughs> That's what the devil does. He says, shut up and get out. The devil say, I got to obey him because he's the holy one of God, but I ain't going without a fight. <laughs> says he cries out one last time and he does what? Shake the man. Say he tears him one last time, but he still has to obey. And at the end of this story, the devil is gone. Grace Place, I, I wish I had a better way to articulate it. It ain't over yet. I'll just say that to you. There's still some shaking going on in this place. And he's still crying out. Gossip. Preach, Holy Ghost. Stuff that we know is not true, but we perpetuate it because he's crying out loud enough. They're broke. They're mismanaging the money. They're trying to run the church. They're, but it's got to go. And it's still written, but our whole prayer in unison this morning ought to be, devil, shut up and get out. 
Let me just throw this at you and I'll be finished. Don't let him use you as a microphone. Don't let him use you as a spokesperson. Don't let him use you. Shut up and get out. And when somebody comes to you with mess, when somebody comes to you, grace place, with malice, when somebody comes to you with envy, when somebody comes to you with jealousy, when somebody comes to you with deceit and slander, you need to look them right in the face and say, shut up and get out. Watch this. And when they get offended, then say, girl, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to that spirit. You stay, but you can't stay and keep him with you. Shut up and get out. Get out. Oh, man, I, I, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to that spirit on your shoulder. You can stay, but it's got to go. Because nothing in Jesus' house should be opposed to him. So you might be a child of God, but if you carry in baggage, if you carry an agenda, if you carry a motive that's opposed to him, shut up and get out. Amen. It's God's house. You're not welcome. Now I can't even say shut up and get out no more. <laughs> somebody going to think I'm talking to you and then I got I to sleep in the garage. You're not welcome. But you have to speak to it. He says shut up and get out. The spirit rends this man. This unclean spirit tears him one more time and cries out one more, but it has to go. And I believe by the unction of the Holy Spirit, God says, grace place, I'm breathing into you and I'm about to take you someplace, but you have to tell him shut up and get out. You got to examine yourself and make sure that it's not on me. That I haven't been a spokesperson, that I have not been a carrier of an unclean spirit, that I have not had a wrong attitude or a wrong disposition towards another human being because I understand I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And, and so, Lord, forgive me if I have been a carrier God. of hindrance to people knowing that you are the Holy One. Watch this because again, he is other and God says, when I come into my house, when I come among my people, I will not share my glory with another and I will not let a tormentor even be comfortable in my presence. How is Grace Place going to thrive? How is Grace Place going to grow? How is Grace Place going to move forward? Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit says the Lord. And in order for my spirit to rule and reign and grow you, we got to get rid of everything that is contrary to him. I got some more, but I'm going to stop right there. Jesus cast this devil out. And it says, then the people were astonished. First verse, they were amazed at his teaching. Now they are astonished at his person. Because not only did he teach with authority, but his teaching has now been backed by his action. His verbiage has been backed by his action. Oh, what a different world the world would be if the church action matched what it spoke. Oh, what a different world it would be if we didn't just say turn the other cheek, but we did it. Oh, what a different world it would be if we didn't just say feed the poor, but we did it. Oh, what a different world it would be if we didn't just tell people, pray for them, but if we actually did it. Jesus' words were backed by his power, and the people, thank you, Holy Spirit, are astonished. And they say, what manner of doctrine is this? Who is this man that even the devils are subject to him? Watch this. And it says, because of what transpired in the church house on that Sabbath day, his fame spread abroad. Grace Place, what is our greatest desire? It is to spread his fame abroad so that everywhere it is known in every corner of the earth, somebody will know who the Holy One of God is. And all I got to say is if we let Jesus cast some stuff up out of here, we won't have to worry about doing newspaper articles or going on Facebook promoting anything. It'll be known that in Grace Place, in God's house, among God's people, the Holy One of God is there. I'm going to stop right there, but I will say this. 
And I'm going to get with Karen this week, and we're going to make a little slide. Help me, Holy Spirit. September 1st is coming. Say, what's September 1st? My birthday. Is there a birthday? <laughs> who, who had a birthday on September 1st? Hey, Amen. Well, on your birthday, sister. See how God like you? He said, on your birthday, this is what's going to happen. September 1st, Grace Place, we've been talking about what type of church we want to be. We've claimed that God has breathed new life into us. We looked at those 10 pillars or 10 points of how to be an effective, spirit-filled, authentic church, and now we're just laying the foundation of Jesus Christ. But September 1st, what's happening September 1st? Remember we talked about the, the, the God doing a new thing, this uh, extreme makeover? September 1st is going to go into action. Say, so how, how do you say that? Just stay tuned. Oh, I, I got to move on, but help me, Holy Spirit. It's been a struggle pastoring here. Not because of you all, beautiful people, but the spirit, the unclean spirits. And it has been a struggle trying to be what God has asked me to be and compromise with what has been for the sake of continuity. And God showed me last week and the week before, especially week before and last week, he said, it's time for you to leave. You've been evaluating long enough. You've compromised with some things long enough. Now I want you to lay it out for the people. This is how you're going to run my house. And this is the people that we have to be if we want to be God's house. And it goes back to those 10 pillars again, but it's some stuff that is time, grace, place that we get in order in this house. I know we were supposed to have another meeting about the building, and I don't want to overspeak anybody's opinion, but one of the things the Lord revealed to me is that's a distraction. It's a distraction, and you need to put it on hold. Not that we don't need a new building for the youth. Not, he said, but it's a distraction because, first of all, you got to get your hearts. And how are you going to build a house together and you still got unclean spirits? that won't speak, that won't love, that won't forgive. It's a distraction. It's a distraction because I want you to win souls for the kingdom, not put another building on the campus that's going to be empty if you're not winning souls for the kingdom. I want you to do outreach before you do inreach. And so it's a distraction that's hindering you from my healing, from my presence, from my purpose. So you can have a meeting if you want at the end of the month to discuss the house. But I'm telling you, because you can outvote me. I'm just one person. But as your pastor, I'm telling you, the Lord say that's a distraction. Because we went from needing to replace the youth house to now a big building that before the youth house was demolished, nobody even thought about adding a multi-purpose build. He says it's a distraction. And I cannot be timid or afraid to start calling out what he has shown me because he called me here not to be liked and not to impress you, but to do what he told me to do. And so September 1st is coming. Did that mean we just sit on our dusties until September 1st? Absolutely not. There are going to be some things happening. going to start meeting with ministries. I'm not even going to go into all of it right now, but it's happening because God is speaking and he's saying, shut up, get out. And anything here that is opposed to God needs to clear out because he said he's not going anywhere. This is his house, and he's taking it back. Amen. Grace place, grace place, grace place. God loves you. He loves you. He saved you. He's brought you through so much. The devil threw his best at you, and you're still here. But he said the reason that, that we're, we, we haven't got, oh, I wish I had time to speak up in here, but I got to go. We still got to do communion. Can, can I just share this real quickly? Remember a couple of Wednesdays ago when we met, and, and Brother Bill was up here talking, and, and the slide kept flipping back to that mountain, that, what is it, Karen, High Sierra or whatever, that, that mountain picture, and the Lord started revealing to me, he said, the reason I keep coming back to that mountain is you've been at this mountain too long. And it's time finally to move forward, Grace Place, watch this, but you have to let stuff go, and you have to speak and command that anything that is opposed to God leave out of here, because you are the litmus, you are the, the, the example, you are the advertisement for Grace Place. Oh, I wish I had time. I know this is not your traditional sermon and service. What, what are you talking about, Calvin? 
When you go out into the community and you just do like this, and hear what's being said about you, hear what's being said about your church, is it good or is it not so good? Is it positive or is it not so positive? I ain't here to bring you down. I'm encouraged because uh, the folks that are out there talking are not in here. So they can say whatever they want because I see what God is doing in here. But the reality of it is that sometimes they get a negative perception. Watch this based on us. Because some things I've heard just out in the community, I say, how could they know that unless somebody is talking? And why would somebody go out and tell what's going on? I don't know about you, but I don't tell what's going on in my family. Not because ain't stuff going on, but what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens if we all got some crazy uncles and some aunts that we embarrass? Oh, come on. Let me, let me, let me, I didn't, I didn't talk too much. But you protect and preserve, and so all I'm saying is there's no such thing as a perfect church, but if, if you are dogging out your church to others, then don't come back to me and say, Pastor, when are we going to three services? We can't get one full because you tell it. <laughs> Shut up and get out. Amen. Shut, up. Shut up and get out. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Holy One of God. And he will not share his glory with another. And he says to tell you, and I'm going to say it and sit down, and we'll extend the invitation. If you're here, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you want to become a member of this church, you want to come and confess before the altar, you want to do whatever you want to do in decency, we extend the invitation to you. But I'm telling you, and I'm going to my seat, and I won't say another word, I hope, except, you know, some announcements or something like that. But God says grace place to let you know this is his house, and he's taking it back. And if you're opposed, shut up and get out. Amen. If you're not opposed, praise him and worship him and get ready for the transformation that is to take place. God bless you. That's all I have this morning. If you're here and you want to come.